Okay, here we are, Luke Acts for Beginners, the name of the course, lesson number three. Uh, this is Jesus in Galilee, His public ministry begins. This is part one, and as far as the text is concerned, we are going to be covering Luke chapter four, verse one, to Luke chapter six, verse 16. So Luke follows the pattern of the other gospel writers by documenting Jesus' ministry in chronological order, beginning with the start of his public ministry. After a brief mention of Jesus' baptism by John, which took place in the Jordan River near Jerusalem, read about that also in Matthew chapter three, and a description of his temptation by Satan while fasting in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. This also uh, mentioned previously in Luke chapter 4, 1 to 13. A scene also described by Matthew and Mark. So we're not going to discuss this uh, as I mentioned before. We're, we're going to try to really drill down on those passages that are exclusive to Luke. So Jesus returns to the northern part of Israel uh, after uh, his baptism, his temptation in the uh, desert. He returns to the north, to the region of Galilee. And this is where Jesus begins his public ministry near his hometown and among the people he knew and grew up with. So we begin in chapter four, verses 14 and 15. Let's read that now. Luke writes, and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about Him spread through all the surrounding district. And He began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. So this is a general summary, the first two verses. Uh, as was the writing style of the times, Luke begins describing Jesus' ministry by giving an overall summary before going into the details. He mentions the two basic components of his ministry at that time. Miracles, talks about, you know, he goes back in the power of the Spirit and that suggests the miracles that he will be doing and teaching in the synagogues in that area. Luke also says that initially Jesus was enthusiastically received by everyone. He was praised by all, however this Enthusiasm would quickly change as Jesus returns to his hometown Nazareth in order to teach in that place. So in chapter 4, 16 to 30, Luke is going to describe a, an episode where Jesus returns to Nazareth. So he describes Jesus' miracles and teaching in general, but now he's going to provide a more detailed account of not only Jesus' teaching, but how the people reacted to that teaching. So we'll go to verse 16 to 21. Luke writes, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So the substance of Jesus' teaching and teaching included, uh, his preaching and teaching included three basic themes. Theme number one, the Messiah and the things that would happen when the Messiah came was now at hand. That was the first theme. The second theme, the second theme was he, Jesus, he was the divine Messiah. He didn't say it exactly in those ways, but in this particular way, but he continually demonstrated through the miracles and suggested through his teaching that he was the divine Messiah. Third element of his teaching, 
those who believed would be the people of God, the chosen ones, the ones belonging to the kingdom, the saints, a lot of different ways to describe the same individuals. And those who did not believe would be excluded from the kingdom. So the passage that Jesus read in his hometown was from Isaiah chapter 61, verses one and two. Now at the time of writing, this was a short range prophecy. In other words, when Isaiah was writing those particular words, it was a short range prophecy. We need to kind of digress here a bit, talk about how the prophets worked and how prophecy worked. Prophets spoke or prophesied in three time periods. For example, they, they taught or they prophesied about current events and issues, sometimes encouraging the people or the leaders, sometimes warning the people or warning the king about certain things that were taking place. If the people were being unfaithful or if they were making alliances with other nations that they shouldn't, the prophets would stand up and say, this is wrong, you shouldn't be doing this and so on and so forth. Uh, it was still prophecy, but it was prophecy or teaching or preaching that was addressing things that were taking place in the present. Then they taught or prophesied, always the same word, about short range future events that could be a day or a year or a century into the future. For example, Jeremiah prophesizes that the people would be uh, taken away into captivity for 70 years and then they would return. Well, that was something that happened in the future, but not like 20 centuries in the future. Uh, in the following century, something would be happening. So that was a short range prophecy. And then they also taught or prophesied about long range future events, many centuries you know, down line. For example, the coming of the Messiah or even further still, the end of the world. Now sometimes the same prophecy or teaching had both a short range and a long range significance. So this passage in Isaiah chapter 61 verses one and two is one of these, the one that Jesus read. The short range teaching or the short range purpose, it spoke of the time when the captives in Babylonian captivity would be released and returned to Jerusalem. It was you know, a prophecy of encouragement, but it also had a long range fulfillment because it also spoke of the wonderful things that would happen in announcing the eventual coming of the Messiah. So at the beginning of the passage, Luke talks about Jesus being in the spirit and thus performing miracles and spirit filled teaching. Then when Jesus sits down and declares that this scripture is fulfilled by him, you know, when he says in your hearing, it means it's going to be fulfilled by the one speaking to you, the one you are hearing right now. Essentially, he is saying that the spirit filled teaching and the spirit powered miracles that you have heard about me doing, these are the things that this particular passage here in Isaiah 61 was referring to. You're seeing it, you're hearing it with your own eyes and your own ears. The time that Isaiah spoke of in this passage is now here. The teaching and the miracles that I am doing bear this out. This is essentially what Jesus was saying to them. So the Lord begins his public ministry by declaring that the Messiah they have read about and waited for is now here. We continue reading in verse 22. He says, or Luke writes, all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? So at first, you know, they, they, they react positively at his words, but also show some doubt because they know he grew up among them and they knew his earthly father, Joseph. So in verse 23 to 30, we continue. And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. 
whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. So Jesus knows that, you know, he knows their doubt and what they want is a miracle done to prove his claim to them. You know, they're saying, hey, you did miracles in other places, and now you're, you know, you're saying you're the Messiah. Show us, do something, do a miracle. But the Lord refuses, citing examples demonstrating their lack of faith in the past. You know, he's saying, you know, in the past, other people did miracles. Elisha did miracles, other prophets did miracles. That didn't change the mind of the people then, they still disbelieved. And so he says, in the same way, I've done miracles, and yet you still don't believe. So this accusation enrages them, and they try to kill him, but somehow he escapes. So we move ahead in uh, chapter four, where Jesus is performing even more miracles. Luke has given us a kind of a close-up view of his teaching and it, how it affected many of the Jews, especially in his hometown. Luke now gives us a close-up view of the other major component of his ministry, and that is the miracle. So we got a close-up view of him teaching in the synagogue and you know, debating back and forth with the people and what took place. Now he's going to give us a close-up view of Jesus performing miracles, beginning in verse 31. And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Let us alone. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. And amazement came upon them all, and they began talking with one another, saying, what is this message? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him was spreading into every locality in the surrounding uh, district. So here one miracle is described and the reaction to it as well. Just like one teaching is, is described previously and one reaction to it, here one miracle is described and the reaction. The evil spirit acknowledges Jesus even before the Jews do. <laughs> but Jesus silences it because he refuses to receive witness from devils. Even if what they're saying is true about him, he does not want them to be the one to make that witness because they are demons. The people were amazed and on account of this, his fame was spreading throughout the county. And so we won't read verses 38 to 44, more information that Luke provides. He describes many more miracles, establishing Jesus' identity and his growing ministry. And he finishes the chapter with the closing statement that Jesus has continued, or rather Jesus continued in his teaching ministry in the synagogues of the northern region of Galilee. This section began with a statement like this and Luke closes it with a similar one. You know, he said Jesus went up, you know, went back home in the region of Galilee, and then he talks about the teachings and the miracles and the things that happened up there. And then he closes out the section by saying, and Jesus was in the region of Galilee teaching and performing miracles. We move on to chapter five. 
uh, where Luke will describe Jesus choosing uh, disciples. So Luke has already mentioned that Jesus was busy teaching in the synagogues and performing amazing miracles. This naturally uh, stirred interest, but also created a need for others to help with Jesus' ever-growing ministry. So we begin in chapter five, verses one, uh, two, and three. Now it happened uh, that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. So this event takes place in Jesus' adult hometown of Capernaum. And the day after he healed Peter's mother-in-law, we uh, would have read about that in chapter four, verse 39. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse four, it says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now it's evident that Peter and his fishing partners knew Jesus since they all lived in the same area and Peter agreed to take Jesus out in his boat. After finishing his teaching, which Peter heard, Jesus tells him to let down his nets to fish. And so Peter is reluctant at first and of course with reason. There's a reason that Peter is reluctant to follow his, you know, uh, his request. For example, he, an experienced and knowledgeable fisherman, had caught nothing. And so how could this rabbi, this teacher, teach him about fishing? He could teach him about the word of God. This he would accept, but teach him about fishing? He was the expert. It was also the wrong time to fish. It was the day. The time to fish was at night into the pre-dawn. Uh, it was the wrong place to fish. The deep waters were not where the fish were in this particular lake. It was also inconvenient. Peter had finished cleaning and storing his nets ready for the next day's fishing. Now he had to break open and you know, use all that equipment over again. It was demanding. Peter and the others had just put in a hard night of work and should be home resting, not sailing about looking for fish at the direction of a religious teacher. It was also embarrassing. The entire village was watching what was about to happen. If he caught nothing again, he would be ridiculed by the other fishermen. And it was wasteful. There were better things he could be doing than wasting time and energy with this rabbi and his ideas about fishing. Well, we know how the story goes. Jesus' teaching has brought Peter to faith. I mean, we know that because he took Jesus out on his boat so that he could teach the crowds. Jesus now challenges Peter to take an additional step of faith Lower the nets, he says. This is a much cost, a costlier action than the first one. Uh, the first one was, well, can I, can I borrow your boat? Can I sit in your boat for an hour or so? You know, put, out, put away from the shore a little bit so I can talk to everybody. I mean, that, that was inconvenient, you know, but not as inconvenient and costly and potentially embarrassing as 
taking direction from Jesus as to where he ought to go lower his nets to catch fish. But Peter's faith, his increased faith, is rewarded by witnessing Jesus' power in a context that he could relate to, and that was fishing. Peter, the fisherman, knows that this is a miracle catch and knows this better than anyone else. He reacts in the same way that everyone in the Bible reacts when facing the Lord or an angelic being. And the way they react is always weakness, shame, awe, falling down on their knees. You know, men and women in the Bible fall down on their knees or on their faces or they want to worship or they're blinded when confronted by the Lord or His angels. In Peter's case, he is instantly aware of his unworthiness and Luke says that his two fishing partners, James and John, were amazed by what they saw. Jesus comforts Peter by telling him that he will give him a new task now that his entire life has been changed. I mean, how do you, <laughs> you can't unsee what you just saw, Peter. You know? I can't unsee that. I, I, I can't forget what has just taken place. I've just witnessed a miracle. Where do I go from here? And so by his ministry of teaching and miracles, Jesus calls the first three of his 12 apostles. Now, the story is told in a few verses, but these three probably knew Jesus from living in the same area and may have been early disciples receiving his teachings. But with this miracle, they make a full commitment to leave everything behind and follow after him exclusively. Luke continues to outline Jesus' ministry of miracles by describing two other healing miracles uh, in verse 12, beginning in verse 12. So let's read that, verse 12. It says, while he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, there's the falling down again, and uh, implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him and he ordered him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But the news about him was spreading even farther and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. So there's the leper. Note here that this is the first time Luke describes someone coming to Jesus in order to ask for a healing. Now leprosy had no cure and those who had it were considered well, they were considered to already be dead. Note this man's boldness and faith and humility. He was relying completely on Jesus for his healing and addressing him with the same deference as Peter did. Both fell down before Jesus in respect and in faith. This man, even before the miracle, Peter did it after he saw the miracle, but this one before he was healed. And so the man's advanced leprosy was healed instantly. Another miracle is reported, this time a paralytic. Let's read verse 17. It says, one day he was teaching and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
But Jesus, aware of their reasoning, answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. Immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear saying, we have seen remarkable things today. So another amazing miracle, but this time Luke describes the animosity building because of one main complaint. Jesus was healing on the Sabbath and the Pharisees and rabbis taught that even the healing of a person on the Sabbath was considered work. Now later on, this will become one of the major stumbling blocks for the priests and the Pharisees who will try to accuse and destroy Jesus because he worked on the Sabbath and as seen in this passage, claimed that he was the Son of God. Their thinking is, how can you be the Messiah? How can you be the Son of God? You're breaking a law. You're breaking God's law. You're working on the Sabbath. Now in the next section, we see Jesus continue adding apostles with the call to Levi, a Jew, but a hated tax collector. So let's jump ahead a little bit. Verse 33. And read, it says, and they said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendants of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come and when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. And he was also telling them a parable, no one, who, uh, no one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the, no, uh, match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins and no one after drinking old wine which, uh, wishes for new, for he says the old is uh, good enough. The old is good enough. So this section um, leads to more uh, controversy because now Jesus is calling people not known for their academic or religious uh, positions. This criticism provides the Lord with the opportunity to warn the people that great changes are coming and they are not prepared to receive them. Uh, in this section here, for example, the old cloth, those are the unbelieving Jews. The new patch, that's the gospel and Christians. The old wineskins, that's the Jewish religious system. And the new wine, again, the gospel and Christianity. The old cannot accommodate the new without damage. The old must change in order to blend with the new. Again, we see a mixture of teaching and miracles by Jesus in order to reveal Himself and the kingdom that exists among them and how they can become a part of it. So in, uh, we continue uh, reading this time in uh, chapter six, beginning in verse uh, one. Luke writes, now it happened that he was passing through some grain fields on a Sabbath and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands and eating the grain. But some of the Pharisees said, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answering them said, have you not even read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priests alone and gave it to his companions. And he was saying to them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to, uh, um, uh, to accuse him. But he knew what they were thinking. And he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he got up and came forward. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to destroy it? 
After looking around at them all, he said to them, stretch out your hand, uh, said to him rather, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored, but they themselves were filled with rage and discussed together what they might do to Jesus. Note that Luke separates the different instances where Jesus chooses apostles with descriptions of his ongoing teaching and performance of miracles, as well as the reaction that the people have to his teachings and to his miracles. Again, let's keep reading, verse 12. It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter and Andrew his brother and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Note again that Jesus prayed before appointing 12 apostles. Uh, an apostle, the term means one who is commissioned, or like an ambassador, you know, has a different meaning than a disciple. Disciple means someone who is a follower but apostle has a richer meaning. Actually, a disciple is one who, who follows, an apostle is one who is sent. Okay, there's the difference. All right, so he called many disciples, but he only chose 12 apostles. He, uh, his night of prayer was on their behalf. He was the son of God. He didn't need guidance in choosing, but he knew the challenge that they would face. And so much of his prayers were for them. So Jesus has firmly established his ministry, teaching and miracles, and now he chooses 12 apostles who, were, who would carry it forward in his, in his name. All right, so even though we, you know, we're covering Luke's gospel in survey fashion, and we're only reading and highlighting certain passages, especially those that are unique to Luke, the material that we're covering still contains valuable and practical lessons for everyone, including ourselves. So I'd like to share a couple of those lessons as we close out our section here today. Lesson number one, uh, beware of spiritual complacency. We see this you know, in the rejection by the leaders at the synagogues. The religious leaders were so invested in their religious traditions that they refused to believe a truth that contradicted their religious traditions, even when that truth was supported by a miracle. Beware of spiritual complacency. Let's always use God's word to establish and to perpetuate a practice in the church, not human ideas about what God would find pleasing. God is pleased when we obey His word. Now, of course, we have traditions in the church. The fact that the morning service is at a particular time, that's not a biblical thing, that's a tradition, isn't it? The fact that we have two services, morning and evening, uh, that's not a biblical command. That we meet on the Lord's day to, have, to, 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 to take the Lord's supper, that's a biblical command. But that we have a service in the morning and a service in the evening to do that, that's not a biblical command, that's a tradition. I, I think it's a good tradition and it serves you know, many spiritual purposes, but nevertheless, it's a tradition. The point I'm making here, the lesson you know, that some of this teaches us, let's not you know, raise traditions to the same level as scripture. That's my point. And that's what these people uh, were doing here. All right, uh, second uh, lesson. Uh, miracles don't always work. I don't mean Jesus failed in doing miracles. I'm saying the performing of a miracle did not always achieve you know, what Jesus wanted it to achieve. And so the surest confirmation of God's presence or God's direction is His confirmed word, not miracles. I mean, Jesus performed many miracles, 37 actually, I mean, you know, the general count. And yet most people rejected Him, even those who witnessed the miracles with their own eyes. That, that's my point. 
many believers, you know, they base their faith on unusual or quote miraculous things that they have read about online or they've heard about from others. But trading on these accounts is not the way to establish and build faith. Faith, the Bible says, comes by hearing the words of Christ, Romans 10, 17. That's how you build faith. The surest way to build faith according to God is to read and believe and obey His word. There is a place for miracles. Jesus used miracles, but in His use of them, we see that even miracles didn't you know, make people believe. And so miracles don't always work. The surest thing is God's word. Third lesson, Jesus is still calling people today. Jesus continues to call people to believe in Him today through the gospel. Believe, repent, be baptized. Mark 16, Matthew 28, Acts 2, all these examples of the apostles in Jesus' name, calling people. Jesus also calls people into ministry through His word. And His word describes the person and the need. The Spirit moves people's hearts towards service of some kind. And the church confirms and commends, in other words, it trains and appoints people into ministry. And elders and deacons and evangelists and teachers serve the local church. That is still going on today. That's my point, that's the lesson. Jesus is no longer calling apostles who were to be the witnesses of His uh, uh, baptism and then His death and burial and resurrection. He's no longer calling apostles like that. That's, that's done with. But He's still calling disciples and he's still calling people into ministry even today. You know, the Great Commission, go into all the world, is still in effect and God continues to search the hearts of those who are ready and willing to step up to a life of ministry of some, of some kind. So Jesus is still calling today. All right, so we're going to stop here. Here's your reading assignment, Luke chapter 6, verse 17 to Luke chapter 8, verse 3. That's the next section that we're going to cover in, the, uh, in lesson number four in our Luke Acts for Beginners series. Okay, thank you for your attention. We'll see you next time.